Freeman, thank you very, very much. It is truly a pleasure to be here with all of you and with uh, my distinguished co-panelists as well, Rima, as with you. But I would like also to pay special tribute to Keiji Fukuda, who organized uh, this session. Uh, I know that CC and the staff and the leadership of the forum uh, work uh, day in and day out and monthly. But I can also say I honestly do not believe the group of people who came together over the last two days would have likely come together as willingly and joyfully for anyone in the world other than KG. And uh, I just want to say for me personally, it's a, it's a real treat to be with you again, KG, and to participate. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, as some of you know, worked uh, in a review of the 1976 swine flu experience in the United States and then uh, served uh, at the WHO on the review of the 2009 uh, H1N1 experience. So I figure I'm due for my next assignment in 2042. <laughs> and I asked myself the question in preparing for these remarks, uh, what is it that's going to be different by 2042? than it was in 2009 or even in 1976. The fact of the matter for me is that there were probably more commonalities than differences between 1976 and 2009. And the challenge for me, and I think for all of us, is what is it that could be done that would make 2042 or 2030 substantially different to what we have experienced uh, to date. I will uh, focus my remarks particularly around influenza, uh, preparedness for influenza pandemics, but the lessons I think are also applicable more broadly. And in my few comments this, uh, this afternoon, I want to really just stress three key ideas. The first idea is that Public understanding is constantly at risk. We talked already today about the difference between panic and preparedness, the paradox of indifference against a known threat and risk, the challenge of gaining political and policy support, which in the end really depends on public understanding and support. And with respect to influenza, uh, I'd like to make two suggestions. The first is that those of us who are concerned about preparedness for influenza pandemics stop talking about the flu. Now, why do I say that? In the public mind, we have for decades complained that people misuse the word flu. They talk about stomach flu. They see cold and flu symptoms being relieved by a medication that's advertised on TV. They have a section in the pharmacy that is about cold and flu and so on, sinuses. To the public mind, it's an ill-defined, rather minor ailment. And so for years, I thought, I've got to work and figure out a way, how do I re-educate the public to understand it's really a serious illness? And I've come to the conclusion, if you can't lick them, join them. And by that I mean, it's okay for the public to have their flu and mean whatever they want with it. What we should do when we're talking about the serious year in and year out and periodic catastrophic threat we should talk about influenza. And you could say, flu may be minor, but influenza is a serious disease. <laughs> now, uh, it's serious in a unique way. I cannot think of another condition that has as severe a burden year in and year out, plus the capacity for periodic, truly catastrophic burden of illness. There are many conditions that have serious year in and year out threat. There are conditions which could be occasionally catastrophic. 
Influenza is both. And that leads me to my second suggestion about public understanding. I think we should stop making such a big distinction between, quote, seasonal and, quote, pandemic influenza. For one thing, the number of deaths and number of illnesses aren't necessarily going to be very well correlated with a year that is hypothetically a pandemic year as compared to other years. And as we know, we contorted ourselves to demonstrate why the 2009 pandemic actually was quite severe, especially in children and pregnant women, et cetera. But last year, the CDC estimated in the United States that we had 80,000 deaths from influenza in the United States of America. Every year in the world, there are probably 600,000 or more deaths to influenza. And periodically, there could be 10 or 100 times more. So that is a uniquely important disease. It's influenza. We need to deal with it year in and year out. We have to contend with it as a serious problem always and contend with it as a potentially catastrophic problem occasionally. So those are the things I think we can do about uh, public understanding. The second uh, point I want to emphasize is really the point that uh, was registered in the 2009 review as the uh, key overarching finding, and it was that the world is ill-prepared to respond to a severe influenza pandemic or to any similarly global, sustained, and threatening public health emergency. You could read Ebola. You could read SARS. You could read the next influenza. And I think it's fair to say that as an overarching judgment, that's still largely valid. But in fairness, we also have to point to and build upon the successes that we've heard about already in the last couple of days and have been substantial and real in terms of organizational preparedness, the improvements in the PIP, the pre-agreements with vaccine distribution, and while we acknowledge the progress and the success, we simultaneously have to recognize the shortfall. If we did have to produce 10 billion doses of vaccine in a given year, is the world capable of doing that? No. There's no we don't have that capacity. Uh, if we really had to mobilize and believe that we would be ahead of the curve in the lead countries rather than behind the curve, what is it that we have available that would enable us to accomplish that? We are constantly at risk, those of us concerned about uh, pandemics and, and influenza in particular, of either being at fault because we've done too much when too little has happened or because we've done too little when too much has happened. And we are in that never, never world today of not being able to discriminate when more should be done and needs to be done and not having the capacity to do enough if it gets to another catastrophic global threat. So uh, that uh, second point really is about organization. Uh, it is about commitment of resource. It's the things we have been talking about all through uh, yesterday and today. But it brings me now to my third point. And the third point is that adequate preparedness is going to require progress along three key technologies. And those are vaccines, diagnostics, and antiviral treatment. For vaccines, we actually need a quadruple jump. Why do I say quadruple? First, our influenza vaccine is effective against the selective small number of strains chosen to make that vaccine effective against. Jump one, we need a vaccine that's effective against all or most strains. So that's the first. Number two, our current vaccine is actually not very efficacious. Maybe 50 to 60% protective under good circumstances. We need a vaccine that's 90% efficacious and protective. 
Number three, the current influenza vaccine is given every year. It's an annual vaccine. We need a vaccine that once given is protective, not for a few months, but for decades. And finally, we need a vaccine that can be produced in scale in a shorter period of time. If we had a vaccine that was all of this, as well as maintaining or improving on the safety of the existing uh, vaccines, we would then have a tool that we could utilize, put in place, not on a crash program annual basis, but on a sustained capacity to protect the population, and we would be way ahead of the curve that we're now behind. Secondly, on diagnostics, we need those home-based diagnostics that we heard about so tantalizingly yesterday morning, but we need them now. We need them that we all have at home and can just dip it in our saliva or in uh, urine or whatever the test is going to be, and it will tell us and our community and our caregivers and our public health authorities what and where, what conditions are now uh, prevalent. And third, we have some antivirals against influenza, but we need the cocktail of antivirals that will be as effective at stifling severe influenza as the HIV cocktail has transformed a death sentence into a manageable chronic disease. And instead, we could be managing acutely the cases and reducing the severity of what would otherwise be a very severe condition. So in summary, if we can work on public understanding, if we can improve our ability to reduce the ill preparedness of the world to cope and respond to a sustained threatening global threat, and if we can make the technological progress on vaccine diagnostics and antivirals, then I think we'll be in a position when I will have a much easier job in 2042 uh, in reviewing the next case. Thank you very much. Thank you.